as an organization focused on delivering responsible power for communities across Canada and the U.S., Capital Power has become a leader in renewable and thermal power generation. Joining me today is Dana Sarek. Senior counsel with Capital Power, who is on the legal side of things and is involved in shaping their many partnerships. She's coming up next on Reimagined Energy. Hi, Dana, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm so pleased to be here. It's wonderful. I just did a quick introduction for you. We're going to dive in in the next few minutes about Capital Power, and I think you're going to uh, kind of give us some information on what a lot of technical terms that we we hear about, we, but we don't quite understand. But let's start. Can you tell us a little bit about Capital Power? Absolutely. Capital Power is a growth-oriented power producer committed to net zero operations by 2045. Uh, we're headquartered in Alberta. We deliver responsible power across North America, so Canada and the United States, through the development, acquisition, ownership, and safe operation of power generation facilities, some of which are renewable generation, like solar and wind, some of which are thermal, like natural gas. Uh, currently, our projects encompass 9,300 megawatts, approximately, of power generation uh, at 32 facilities across the continent. Uh, one of the tools in our company toolbox for both delivering reliable and affordable power today, as well as decarbonized power systems for tomorrow, uh, is through the use of PPAs. PPAs. Okay. So... Capital Power recently announced a long-term, large-scale power purchase agreement, which is a PPA, I guess, with Saputo. And how do PPAs factor into, into Capital Power's business? Yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, Capital Power has... <laughs> yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, Capital Power has a number of PPAs for power right. purchase agreements with both public and private entities. And these PPAs serve to optimize our role and participation in the deregulated Alberta power market. So, as I mentioned, we have a large and diverse power generation portfolio in the province, uh, mm -hmm. consisting mainly of renewables, being wind and solar, uh, and gas. And we can sell that power in a variety of ways uh, into the deregulated spot power market. That one has a very highly variable power price uh, based on supply and demand on an hourly basis. We can execute sales in the forward markets for the electricity that we produce, and we can create, foster, and build relationships with our main customers through partnering with them on these power purchase arrangements. So PPAs are definitely an important part of our business. Uh, generally, we look at these large-scale contracts as a means of creating win-win situations. Uh, it's a win for our customers because they benefit from competitively priced, customizable contracts that secure on a large scale and over a long term electricity and renewable attributes at crisis that work for them. At the same time, it's a win for us because these contracts are an avenue for capital power to fix in our project economics and build long term relationships with those customers. Well, it's a win for us too because the Subito makes a lot of cheese. And so the better, yeah, <laughs> the better the cheese, the more we get, right? So you're alienating so, your lactose intolerant subscribership. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so let's talk about PPAs, like these power purchase agreements. Can you explain what they are in kind of a general sense? Yeah, absolutely. You might hear that term being thrown around more and more as PPAs become more uh, popular. Uh, what it stands for is power purchase agreement or power purchase arrangement. And what they are are bilateral commercial agreements where the buyer, also known as the cost taker, purchases notional electricity directly from the seller or the power generator rather than from like, a distribution company. Uh, so there's a contractual means of buying and selling power. You're not actually buying physical electrons. It is a, a virtual PPA or a, a contractual mechanism. I'm just throwing out some words that you might hear commonly when yeah. talking about PPAs. Uh, you can think of it as a contractual alternative to buying electricity at the variable price on the spot market uh, for an industrial buyer or whatever fixed or floating price is being offered by the local utility. 
So in the so long run, it's a lot more like economical, you would say. For they absolutely can be. Um, and it can be particularly attractive it can be written related to power markets with a highly variable uh, power price. For instance, in Alberta, we have an hourly settlement mechanism with price can vary significantly um, throughout the day and across time. And so PPAs are a great mechanism to lock in pricing. Um, given some of that uh, context, it's usually between a utility scale power generation company, such as Capital Power, and a public entity, you can, like including environment, or a private entity. Um, and we think of off takers, think of large corporate consumers of electricity, such as Saputo, um, such as large manufacturing facilities, technology companies like the Amazons and the Googles of the world, food processing plants, data mining companies, anyone who might have electricity as a large and costly input to their business might be interested in a PPA. Um, because of that ability to lock in pricing, they often have long terms, think like 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, often PPAs are tied to a specific project or a bundle of projects, and that can be attractive for a number of reasons. Um, PPAs are really growing in popularity, particularly for renewable generation and in deregulated power markets such as Alberta. Uh, that's driven by project economics, the growth in corporate sustainability pledges by the off takers, uh, and the general push both through legislation and through uh, social impact of um, sustainability uh, initiatives like various kinds. So who are the kinds of off takers uh, that we deal with and who are attracted to PPAs? Uh, as I mentioned. PPAs are really popular with buyers that need a large volume of power over many years and who benefit from locking in that fixed price as an input to their business. Um, when do we enter into them is something interesting that people might not realize uh, because they get announced sporadically uh, in the press, such as our um, recent announcement of our long-term TKA with Kudo. But PPAs are frequently negotiated before the project is even you know, constructed. So years before those electrons are ever put onto the power grid. Um, that way, it's attractive to the power generator, which derives revenue certainty once the project is built. And um, it, it's surprisingly far in advance of when the general public would think about contracting for the consumption of electricity. Uh, what you might hear in the PPA world is the term bundled PPA. Uh, and what that means is the sale of electricity is bundled with the sale of some other sort of environmental attribute. Uh, frequently associated with renewable energy connections. So when you hear bundled PPA, you're usually talking about uh, generation from a renewable project, such as wind or solar. Key feature of PPAs, uh, flexibility. Remember that PPAs are a legal agreement. It's a contractual arrangement. So parties don't have to deliver electrons to each other, or they only have to be connected on the same electrical grid or located in the same county, province, or even country. So PPAs really permit great flexibility for both generators and off-takers in a variety of jurisdictions to meet their own needs in a mutually beneficial way. They can negotiate the term that suits them, the quantity of the commodities that are being purchased, uh, the timing of when those will be delivered and when the contract will start, and the allocation of various risks, legal and regulatory risk, construction risk, um, and, and various types of operational and commercial risks can all be negotiated in a really flexible manner. So PPAs are a really important tool uh, for a number of generators, including capital power. Um, we're an active member of something called Business Renewable Center Canada. Uh, it's a nonprofit initiative seeking to catalyze the market for non-utility procurement of renewable generation. So both through our participation in BRC Canada and our interaction with our many customers in Alberta, we have a really good feel for the state of the market uh, and where our customers' needs are. And on the flip side, having a really large and diverse portfolio in Alberta allows us to provide creative solutions to those variety of customers and come up with a number of PPAs that are uh, potentially multi-commodity and was really customized in terms of conditions. Uh, so when we think of PPA, Tim Bali is a contract. Uh, don't think of one particular type of form contract. Uh, they're really customizable to meet the needs of both the generators and the operators. Awesome. That sounds really interesting. I, I never would have thought any of these components, you know, that all go behind the scenes. You never really think of that. How about renewable energy certificates or RECs? Oh, yeah, great question. Uh, 
frequently bandied about term, not often very well understood. Uh, mm. So I'll just cover the highlights. A yeah. REC, or Renewable Energy Certificate. It's a type of, type of credit created for every megawatt hour of renewable generation. So any grid-connected consumer of electricity, whether that's a company or whether that's you or I as household consumers, we can't claim that our operations are actually powered by green or carbon neutral sources because we can't control the electrons we receive when we turn on the lights. Uh, and electricity is not produced uh, from entirely carbon neutral sources. So one way that an entity can claim that their operations on a notional or net basis are uh, green, quote unquote, uh, is through the creation or purchase and then the retirement or cancellation of these RECs. Um, so RECs that have been created and then retired allow companies to claim that their operations are green and that they have notionally reduced their scope to emissions associated with whatever power they consumed. Um, a REC is just one type of environmental attribute, really commonly referred to as a carbon credit. So you might hear those terms interchangeably. Right. Well, speaking about carbon credits, you know, they're very much a hot news topic these days, but a lot of people don't really understand, you know, uh, what they are or how they work. Can you briefly explain what a carbon credit is? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll do you one better. I'll explain how they tie into PPAs as well. Awesome. Wow. Uh, so when you think of carbon credits, recognize that it's not a certificate that you carry around with you. Uh, it's a statutory construct or a policy construct. It notionally, one carbon credit, whatever name it carries or whoever has issued it, one carbon credit represents one ton of carbon dioxide or an equivalent volume of other greenhouse gas that has either been removed from the atmosphere or which was avoided being emitted. So always think of a carbon credit as a ton of carbon dioxide or equivalent that didn't get out there um, because of some action that's taken. So there's many different types of carbon credits. Some of them are jurisdictionally specific and they're created under provincial or federal legislation. We have those in Canada. Um, other types of carbon credits are recognized under voluntary carbon standards and protocols. Um, they're not as jurisdictional and specific. So what I mentioned are just one type of carbon credit. Under the Alberta regulatory structure, we have another kind called emission offsets. Um, carbon credits can be governed by many different registries and protocols, in some cases overlapping, in some cases they differ a little. What they all have in common uh, is that they have to meet stipulated requirements to ensure that they do result in that ton of carbon dioxide emissions were equivalent, and that they're real, that they're verifiable, often by a third party, uh, that they're quantifiable, uh, that they're additional, and what that means is that they wouldn't have occurred under status quo operations, uh, and that they're permanent. So carbon credits are issued to projects that voluntarily reduce their emissions or remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Electricity produced from renewable sources qualifies for the generation of different types of carbon credits, uh, largely because they displace thermal generation. <laughs> largely because they displace thermal generation from fossil fuel sources. Um, there's lots of other different kinds of examples. Um, for instance, afforestation or reforestation, because trees um, consume carbon. Please stretch this. Uh, yeah, no, that's just a good time. time. So it was around 12.50. Just kind of tighten it up a little bit. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I'll say carbon credits are issued to projects that voluntarily reduce emissions or remove carbon from the atmosphere. And electricity produced from renewable sources, such as wind and solar, qualifies for different types of carbon credits to be generated because they displace thermal generation from fossil fuel sources. There are, of course, many other types of carbon credits. Um, Nature-based solutions, for instance, afforestation or reforestation and other conservation efforts will be eligible, um, as well as, for example, energy efficiency uh, mechanisms, such as the reduction of leaks or vented emissions. So how are carbon credits generally relevant to PPAs um, is that the parties can negotiate whether, what type, how much, for what duration carbon credits they would like to have involved in the overall PPA transaction. Um, for instance, Capital Power's uh, renewable projects are set up to offer both RECs recognized under eco-logo standards uh, or 
emission offsets, which are eligible under the Alberta tier regulatory regime uh, for regulated specified emitters of uh, lower volumes of specified gases. But depending on what buyers are looking for, um, they can negotiate to purchase one or both types of these carbon credits under their PPAs. That can change over the term of the PPA. The volume that they want can change under the term of the PPA. You can only create one carbon credit for each megawatt hour of renewable generation. We can only create one type of carbon credit, um, such as a rack or an emission offset, from each megawatt of renewable generation so that there's no risk of double dipping. That different PPA counterparties may negotiate for uh, different types of credits or even splitting them, uh, splitting the project attributes to meet their various needs. What's interesting about partnering with a power generation company such as Capital Power, which actively trades RECs and emission offsets, uh, is that PPA buyers who may need, because they are a compliance buyer uh, and regulated by a provincial or federal authority, or want, because of their stipulated corporate ESG targets, uh, to buy these, they may not have an avenue for monetizing them. And so trading under a PPA with an entity such as Capital Power um, allows them to use our services to monetize those carbon credits or those environmental attributes rather than retiring them for their own needs. How carbon credits are relevant to PPAs uh, mm -hmm. is that they can be bundled with the purchase and sale of electricity as needed or as wanted uh, by the buyer, whether they are regulated uh, under, whether they are regulated uh, as a uh, specified large emitter. For instance, uh, or whether they want to need their own voluntary sustainability targets. And the great flexibility offered by PPAs makes sure that the parties can negotiate a mutual beneficial arrangement as to what type or amount of carbon credits are traded. Interesting. So here's your last question before I let you go. But how can Indigenous communities participate in decarbonization through PPAs? That's a great question, and one that's seeing increasing attention in Canada uh, with our focus on reconciliation. So, Indigenous communities can participate in the PPA market and in decarbonization generally through PPAs in several ways. Um, they can, of course, develop their own renewable projects. They can partner with existing renewable energy developers to build and operate renewable energy projects on traditional lands, or they can come up with other commercial arrangements. Uh, for the development of projects off of Indigenous traditional lands. Um, they can be equity participants in the, in the electricity project, uh, wherever that project may be located, or they can have other meaningful financial participation or decision-making rights associated with the project. Um, the PPA is a contractual catalyst for some of this Indigenous participation because the benefits to the community can be baked into the PPA. Uh, we can negotiate contractually to ensure that associated with the development and operation of a project, that a community benefits from job creation, either through the construction phase or following that in the operation phase, through revenue sharing mechanisms, through capacity building, and then following receipt of the proceeds of that PPA, the Indigenous community can invest that revenue generated in community-led decarbonization efforts, uh, such as energy efficiency upgrade, sustainable transportation, climate resilient infrastructure, uh, just a couple of examples. So equity participation in power infrastructure, participation in decision-making and meaningful participation financially through a variety of mechanisms are all viewed as a means of reconciliation and they're all able to be contractually negotiated within the confines of a power purchase agreement. That's awesome. I have to thank you for, for joining me today. I feel like, um, I had PPA, you know, 101, I had REC 101, you know, how does this, how does this all help entities fulfill their ESG requirements? Wonderful question. Uh, the most obvious way is through the E, the environmental mechanism. And we talked about that a little bit when we spoke about RECs and other types of carbon credits. So renewable PPAs or PPAs with renewable projects. Uh, provide our customer with zero carbon electricity, reducing their scope to emissions and the carbon impact of their own operations. Bundled PPAs are the means of achieving the environmental goal. Um, but social and governance elements are also important parts of the ESG picture. 
and often underappreciated aspects of how PPAs can uh, accelerate the energy transition. So for instance, Capital Power has a sustainable sourcing policy in place, and that outlines our commitment to responsible procurement and defines our ESG expectations on our suppliers for the various renewable projects that we develop and operate. So this provides certainty for our PPA customers that the upstream supply chain has ESG uh, considerations in mind. Um, one example is our purchasing decisions related to solar panels. Uh, those benefits indirectly flow through to our PPA counterparties on solar projects uh, throughout North America. Uh, we have a contract with First Solar, which specifies that the large volume of solar panels that we procure for our solar projects as a company will not contain polysilicon, uh, which, as you may know, uh, the overwhelming proportion of which is mined under forced labor conditions uh, in China. And so we have avoided that risk through our procurement policy, uh, which in turn ensures some of those um, social benefits flow through to our PPA counterparties on the projects associated with those solar panels. Another one that's really important to the PPA buyers is community engagement. And that can be important to certain PKA counterparties and one that can be reflected through either the uh, RFP process for getting to the PKA or by the terms of the contract itself. And so community engagement is one additional means of ensuring that ESG is reflected throughout the value chain of the power project that's the subject of the contract. So in that way, PPAs can act as a contractual means for capital power, and our PPA counterparties to optimize, uh, in our case, the operations uh, of our projects. The financial outcomes realized by both parties on the sale and purchase of large volumes of electricity and both parties' ESG goals. Thank you so much, Dana, for explaining all of these complex terms that are being thrown around, but nobody really knows a lot about. So I really thank you for taking the time to explain them and all the, the work that Capital Power and, and, and you do. I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to talk about these issues uh, at any and all times, and I hope it was enlightening for your viewers. It sure was. Thanks again. Have a great day. PPAs, REZs, and carbon credits, all explained by Dana Sarek of Capital Power. This podcast is sponsored by Smart Energy. I'm your host, Maria McGowan. Thank you for listening today, and we'll see you next time.